Good evening. I'm Rabbi Ari Sunshine, and on behalf of the rest of the clergy, staff, lay leadership, and community here at Sherith Israel, I'd like to welcome you all here for this evening's Yom HaShoah commemoration. A few times each year, the sanctuary is filled in much the same way it is tonight, including at Purim and large B'nai Mitzvahs, and of course, High Holy Days, Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur. And coincidentally, Yom Kippur's Torah reading is the one that we read this week, uh, Parshat Acharei Mot. And we read of the special ritual of the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, uh, what he used to undertake on the holiest of holy days. After offering a, one of two specially selected goats for a sacrifice, he would then confess the sins of the Israelites onto the second goat and send it out of the camp and into the wilderness. And in that way, symbolically, Israel's sins would be carried away with it. Eventually, we, that goat came to be known as an escape goat, and giving way later to a term that we all know too well, scapegoat, someone who is blamed for the wrongdoings or mistakes or problems of others, often for expediency's sake. Sadly, midor lador, from generation to generation, the Jewish people have often been a convenient scapegoat for others. As the Passover holiday that we just finished celebrating reminds us, we were strangers in the land of Egypt, enslaved by a Pharaoh who feared the Israelites in his country's midst. Later in the Bible, in the book of Esther, we see Haman whispering to King Ahasuerus that there is a certain people scattered and dispersed in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from those of every people. Neither do they keep the king's laws and thus manages to get permission from Ahasuerus to perpetuate genocide against the Jewish people, a decree only averted by the fortuitous presence of Mordechai and Esther at the right place and the right time. Jump to the Middle Ages, we have countless examples of Jews being scapegoated, excluded, and attacked, subjected to anti-Semitic accusations such as the blood libel, relegated to social 
socially inferior occupations like money lending and even expelled from multiple European countries. Modern times featured many more anti-Semitic tropes reappearing and emerging, the protocols of the elders of Zion and people like Henry Ford echoing Haman's words from the Bible when in 1922 he said, there is a super government which is allied to no government which is free from them all and yet which has its hands in them all. Hatred, discrimination, and violence culminated in the Shoah in which six million Jews, including 1.5 million children, were scapegoated and slaughtered by the Nazi regime and its supporters for having been different and inferior in their eyes. We also know all too well that the anti-Semitism that has manifested itself through the ages and reached the most awful of pinnacles in the form of the genocide of the Shoah still exists even here in the US. Charlottesville, Pittsburgh, Poway, Muncie, Jersey City, even 40 minutes down the road from here in Colleyville. So how do we respond to anti-Semitism, me door le door, from generation to generation? We stand up and reject it, me door le door, in every generation, loudly and without hesitation, in every town, in every city, in every state, in every country. We testify, me door le door, in every generation, including the grandchildren this evening who will be telling their grandparents' stories about the horrors other human beings have inflicted upon us, but equally as much about the power of the human spirit to overcome these atrocities. We affirm, me door le door, in every generation, the deep bond with our Jewish story and people that energizes us not just to remember, but to respond to our remembrance of even these painful experiences, to become upstanders and speak out for and help anyone who is being oppressed, even those in Ukraine whose ancestors oppressed us less than a century ago. And we embrace our Judaism, me door le door, in every generation, living proudly and Jewishly without fear and passing the love of our tradition on to our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren, proclaiming multiple times daily in the Kedushah, in the Amidah prayer, Lador Vador Nagid Godlecha, from generation to generation, we will tell of God's greatness. As the contemporary Jewish bluegrass group Nefesh Mountain reminds us, Lador Vador Nagid Godlecha, the light in us shines on and on. I will now light the first memorial candle of the evening in memory of one million of the six million Jews killed in the Holocaust. May this light remind us not only to remember those treasured souls lost from our people during the Shoah, but also remind us to keep our light the light of family, of community, of Shabbat, of love, of compassion, of tzedakah, of every human being created in the divine image. May this light also continue to burn brightly in this generation and throughout the generations to come. After I light this candle, our commemoration will continue with a welcome from Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you so much, Rabbi Sunshine, for your remarks and for generous, generously hosting us tonight. Um, it is a joy to be here in this beautiful chapel and to be with all of you in person for our annual Yom HaShoah commemoration. As Rabbi Sunshine said, I'm Mary Pat Higgins. I'm the president and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And it is a real pleasure to be able to share this experience with all of you tonight, to be here together 
um, for this important day of remembrance. This is the first time we've been able to be together in person for our Yom HaShoah commemoration since 2019, which in some ways feels like a lifetime ago. To see our survivors here and, and so many friends and family in the community is truly special. While it's been extraordinary to see the ways people have come together over the past two years, even when they could not share physical space, I know many of us were waiting for moments like this, so thank you for being with us. I'm grateful to be with you all tonight as we remember the six million Jews who were murdered during the Holocaust and honor our incredible survivors. Before we proceed, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the survivors in our community that we have lost over the past year. Ruth Altman, Andrew Rosenberg Bramley and Belle Seals, who were listed in our program book, and Helen Pringler Biederman, who we lost earlier this week. May their memories be for a blessing. When Israel wrote Yom HaShoah as a Remembrance Day into law in 1959, it did so with the intention of commemorating the disaster which the Nazis and their collaborators brought upon the Jewish people and the acts of heroism and revolt performed. The acts of heroism and revolt performed. I stress that line because amidst the horrors of the Holocaust, we saw the greatest acts of bravery not only in the armed uprisings in the Warsaw Ghetto, in the death camps, and in the forest, but also in the quieter acts of resistance. A family lighting Shabbat candles despite being forbidden from practicing their religion. A teacher gathering children in the worst of conditions to feed their minds. Neighbors sharing their last loaf of bread. Tonight, we mourn the loss of six million Jews and honor these acts of courage and defiance. We know firsthand how important it is to share these stories, to educate about the history of the Holocaust and the consequences of blind hatred and for generations to come. I know everyone in this room tonight understands the responsibility we all bear that the lives extinguished during the Holocaust and the stories of our survivors are never forgotten. We've learned the meaning of resilience, gratitude, and strength from the men and women in front of me tonight to our survivors. Please know that we do not take this responsibility lightly. Tonight, we honor the idea of Mador Lador from generation to generation. Every day at the museum, we see the impact of personal stories that they have on visitors, especially our students. The statistics about the Holocaust and other genocides are so devastating that they can be difficult to fathom. But when you hear the story of someone who lived it, the abstract comes to life. We are so thankful to our survivors who have spent the last decades sharing their stories, and now to their children, grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren, and generations to come who will continue to share this experience. We are honored at the museum to be welcoming second and third generations of survivors to come and tell their parents' and grandparents' stories, and tonight, our program will feature the story of survivors read by their grandchildren, the embodiment of their legacies. We will continue our commemoration with our first testimony reading of the evening from Lindsay Gerard, granddaughter of Holocaust survivors Felicia and Emmanuel Feiger. But first, I light a candle in memory of one million of the six million Jews killed in the Holocaust. Good evening. 
My grandparents, Felicia and Emmanuel, lovingly called Nanny and Poppy, were born in Poland in 1922. My nanny had three brothers, Henry, Simon, and Nathan. My poppy was the oldest of six children, and his family grew fruit trees and ran a carpet factory. In 1936, Poppy moved to Warsaw to study engineering at a prestigious school, one that typically did not admit Jewish students. War came to Poland in 1939. While Nanny and her family were in Krakow, living under German occupation, Poppy escaped to Warsaw and returned to his home of Kosiv, which was under Soviet occupation. Conscripted and assigned to an aviation school in Leningrad, he began training in Kosiv as a base mechanic. In 1941, German troops overtook Kosiv the day before my poppy was supposed to leave for Leningrad. His family was allowed to stay in their home, but Nanny and her family were forced into the Krakow ghetto and later Sozo ghetto. During a routine roundup, her parents, along with all involved Jews, were murdered. My Nanny managed to obtain false papers and live with a Catholic family whose generosity and bravery were never forgotten. In Kosiv, along with his father and brothers, my poppy was forced to labor in a brick factory. To avoid having his youngest brother taken away, he registered him as being 12 years old, though he was only seven. One morning in October 1941, he and his family were harvesting potatoes. They heard shooting in the distance and assumed it was a military exercise. A passing farmer told them Jews were being rounded up, shot, and left in mass graves. They later learned that 2,000 Jews were killed in this action. A year later, all Jews in Kosiv were told to report to the local soccer stadium. My poppy told his brother to hide his mother and other siblings in a cornfield while he reported to the stadium to see what was happening. Once the Jews were inside, the SS surrounded the area. Anyone who attempted to hide was shot. Poppy was sent to a border patrol station along with other skilled workers. Those without an occupation deemed useful were deported to Belzec death camp and murdered. His first night at the border patrol station, my poppy escaped and ran to a neighbor's house to find his family. He learned his mother, siblings, and other relatives had been betrayed by another neighbor, discovered by the Nazis, and deported. Too late to help his own family, he became resolved to help as many as possible. His station bordered Poland and Romania, so any Jews caught trying to enter Romania were sent there. As often as he could, my poppy had prisoners released on work detail and facilitated their escape. Several months later, an officer warned poppy that the Gestapo were planning to take all the Jews who worked at the station and advised him to join a group of partisans in the forest. Instead, he chose to return to Kosiv to warn the remaining Jews. He was spotted and arrested, but managed to escape and locate the partisan group. Poppy stayed with them for several months, sabotaging the Germans by blowing up bridges and disrupting troop movements. In 1943, though they hadn't met yet, both my grandparents decided to cross into Hungary, where Jews were still safe from deportation and ghettoization. Traveling with her three brothers, Nanny and her family were soon betrayed, and her youngest brothers, Nathan and Simon, were hanged. She escaped with her older brother, Henry, who carried her across the mountains on his back as she was too grief-stricken to walk. Upon their arrival in Hungary, they were jailed and tortured under suspicion of being Jewish. My poppy traveled to Hungary with a friend, his sister, and her daughter, whom he carried most of the way. In the first town they came to, a kind woman directed them to the local synagogue where they hid for two days while the Jewish community arranged for false papers. They traveled to pay to, they traveled by train to Budapest and then were taken, by, were taken in by the Jewish community who advised them to register as non-Jewish Poles with the Polish committee. Passing as a Catholic, my poppy learned Hungarian quickly and was recruited by the underground to help Jewish refugees. He was assigned to help a group of women who he liberated from jail and found them jobs and places to stay. One of these women was my nanny. One night, the Gestapo came to my poppy's apartment. He attempted to escape, but was unsuccessful. When searching his apartment, the Gestapo found a box under his bed with money and false papers. He was jailed as a spy, interrogated and tortured, but revealed nothing about his work with the underground. June 1944, the Allies were bombing Hungary. While the guards were sheltering in the prison's basement, Poppy gradually worked the bars in his window out of their frame and escaped his captors this time with seven other young Jewish men also accused of being spies. 
Deportations of Hungarian Jews to Auschwitz were underway, and my poppy knew it was time to leave. He helped organize a smuggling operation to get Jews into Romania. He and my nanny crossed the border and arrived in Arad, which had a sizable Jewish community. The head of the community tried to set up my poppy with a local girl, but he said he had a fiance, even though he had not yet asked my nanny. They were married on August 20th, 1944. The following week, while traveling to Bucharest, the train was bombed. While helping my nanny and others escape, my poppy suffered nearly fatal injuries. Large amounts of shrapnel from a bomb the Nazis dropped penetrated his leg. He managed to get to a cornfield where he made a tourniquet out of his belt. Eventually, he was taken to a Romanian military field hospital, then to a hospital in Timisoara. He developed gangrene, and since there were no antibiotics available, the doctors wanted to amputate, but my nanny refused. Miraculously, he healed on his own and was released six months later. 1945, the war was finally over. They reached Bucharest and discovered that Henry had survived the war and joined the Czech underground. After traveling through Europe for, se for, through Europe for several years, my grandparents arrived in New York in January 1948. In 1957, they moved to Dallas. I feel so grateful to be standing here today and sharing their story. When asked in his testimony what he would say to his grandchildren, my poppy said they should be proud of their heritage and who they are. I could not be prouder to be a product of their strength and courage. May their memories be a blessing. I now light a candle in memory of my grandparents and one million of the six million Jews killed in the Holocaust. So much, Lindsay. I'd now like to welcome Hassan Itzkashkrebker um, with Kinder Yarn. Stuck in the stock, 
свой хапе. Ой, вишнеле берги, он шайн гевойр. I would now like to continue with Reve Campo, granddaughter of Gusta and Jack Kleinman, to share her grandparents' story. <laughs> Needed a little help, sorry. I am honored to share my family's story with you the same story that I will one day share with my own children. All of the European family names that are part of this story are of blessed memory. My grandmother, Gusta Yosler Kleiman, was born in Rodevitz, Romania in 1932. My grandfather, Yehiel Jack Kleiman, was born in Poland in 1925. Though their Holocaust experience as European, Eastern European Jews were very different, Nazi brutality meant the devastation of the lives they each had known. Almost immediately after Germany's invasion of Poland in 1939, my grandfather Yehiel and his brother Gary were rounded up and sent to Gross Maslowitz, a labor camp outside of Brussels in Germany. Conditions were filthy and food was scarce. For a short while, my grandfather's non-Jewish housekeeper used to come by and throw food over the fence and as much as possible, a kind guard at the labor camp snuck food to my grandfather. My grandfather's mother, Chaya Kleiman, and his baby brother both died in a Nazi gas chamber. While in the camp, my grandfather had two priorities, to take care of his brother Gary and to disrupt the Nazi war machine as much as he could. While on work detail, he sabotaged equipment, stopping only when a friendly guard told him that the SS had caught on and was looking for the culprit. Though Gross Ma Masowitz wasn't a death camp, there was an ever-present threat of violence. Prisoners could be killed for any minor transgression, real or perceived. He and his brother spent three and a half years in Gross Masowitz. While my grandfather was doing his best to survive the camp, my grandmother Gusta and her family removed, uh, were removed from their home in Rodewitz, Romania and sent to the Bershad Ghetto, which is now geographically part of Ukraine. My grandmother's father was able to travel with extra supplies and clothing, but was forced to leave everything behind as soon as they arrived. Jews were stripped of all valuables, including jewelry. Grandmother Gusta's family arrived in the ghetto with almost nothing. My great-grandparents and my grandmother's sister, Razi, quickly contracted typhus, which was rampant in the ghetto. They were too sick to work, and my great-grandfather was afraid to leave the house and risk being rounded up on the streets. At only nine years of age, my grandmother suddenly found herself responsible for keeping her family alive. A woman gave her work selling candy door to door in exchange for the money, she gave my grandmother cornmeal so she could make Mama Liga a Romanian porridge. The family survived this way until they were liberated by Soviet troops. Back in Poland, Gross Malsowicz was liquidated and my grandfather was moved to Klittendorf, another labor camp, then to Gross Rosen, one, one of the harshest concentration camps. The first thing my grandfather remembered seeing when he arrived, arrived at Gross Rosen was a man who had been hanged for stealing a potato. He knew he would need to be both careful and fortunate to survive. As the Soviets closed in on the Eastern Front, inmates of Gross Rosen were sent on a death march. My grandfather was finally liberated by US troops near Feldefing, 20 miles southwest of Munich. After liberation, he traveled to Munich 
to look for his father while his brother traveled east to do the same thing. He managed to find his older brother, Joe, who shared the good news that their father had also survived and was recovering in a hospital. There he learned that his mother and younger brother had both been killed in a camp. My grandfather then went back to Poland with two friends to look for more family. When he arrived in his hometown, he stayed the night with a family friend. The two friends he had traveled with were shot and killed the night they returned by Poles who were afraid they were coming to reclaim their houses and land. My grandfather had a decision to make since Poland was no longer home. He could have gone to the U.S. where he had relatives, but in his words, he wanted to fight to have his own country so nobody could tell him, Jew, get out of here. Recruited by the Irgun, my Zionist paramilitary organization, he was assigned first to Marseille, then to Italy, where he worked stealing and smuggling weapons. After several years, he was identified as a member of the underground and knew he had to flee. The British jailed him in a detention camp on the island of Cyprus. After years of suffering in Nazi concentration camps, he was once again behind barbed wire and malnourished. After my grandmother was freed from Bersha ghetto, she and her family traveled back to Romania, mostly on foot. When they got back to their hometown, their house was still standing, but everything had been taken, furniture, supplies, and even the glass from the windows. Her parents decided to send her and her younger sister to what was then Palestine because in their words, you never know when there will be another Hitler. My grandmother, about 16 years old, and her 14-year-old sister traveled to Bulgaria by train, then boarded a large ship carrying thousands of refugees who were children. The British forced their kinder boat to take its passengers to Cyprus instead of Palestine. My grandmother remembered being one of many children on this journey. There was little food or water, and many of the children became ill. When they arrived on Cyprus, inmates escorted them off the ship. Because, because they were minors, my grandmother and her sister were released from camp after three months and given passage to Palestine. They first lived on a kibbutz and picked, picked oranges. My grandma, grandmother then got a job in a restaurant, and her sister worked in a factory. While gaining fluency in Hebrew, my grandmother also arranged to get the paperwork so her parents could immigrate to Israel. Back in Cyprus, my grandfather remembered when Golda Meir, then head of the political department of the Jewish Agency and future Prime Minister of Israel, visited the jail with a team of nurses. She was appalled at the conditions and arranged for medical assistance, supplements, and additional food. After Israel became independent in 1948, my grandfather was released from Cyprus and he arrived in Israel. My grandfather, Yehiel, a very good-looking young man, had a date with a young woman. He went to her tent to pick her up, but she was not there. However, her roommate was my grandmother, Gusta, <laughs> and they decided to go out. Long story short, they were married in 1950. My dad, Henry, was born in Jaffa in 1953. At this time, my grandfather was, had another decision to make. He had been a member of the, the Irgun and then joined the Israeli Defense Forces and was part of the Galani Infantry Brigade. As a bricklayer, he helped to physically build the young state of Israel. He had to decide what was next for the family's future. In 1956, he immigrated to the United States and stayed with his family in New Jersey. One year later, he brought Grandma Gusta and my dad to the U.S. My Aunt Rochelle of blessed memory was born in 1960 in the U.S. My grandparents went through something that few of us can imagine, but they were grateful for the life they had and always put others first. My grandfather was a speaker at the Dallas Holocaust Museum. My grandparents wanted nothing more than their children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren to have a better life as Jews, and we do, things in no part to them. In their darkest times, they never lost hope of their commitment to helping others. May their mem memory be for a blessing. I now light a candle in memory of my grandparents and one million of the six million Jews killed in the Holocaust.
I would now like to welcome Elisa Teichman, granddaughter of Ellen Kaufman and Blima and Isaac Teichman. Thanks, Mary Pat. It is an honor for me to be here today to share the stories of three of my grandparents, Ellen Zacharias Kaufman and Blima and Isaac Teichman. My grandmother Ellen was born in 1922 in Mainz, Germany. She had a twin sister, Ruth, and an older sister, Hetty. In 1936, Hetty immigrated to Dallas with the help of their cousins, the Kahns. A couple years later, my grandmother applied for visas to the US with her mother, Selma, and twin sister, Ruth. Her visa arrived first. She wanted to wait for her family, but she was running out of time to escape before the borders closed. She immigrated to the US in October of 1939, joining the Khans in Dallas. Ruth and Selma's visas never arrived, and they were deported to Gers, a concentration camp in France. While the family worked to get Selma and Ruth out of Europe, my grandmother graduated from Highland Park High School. She could have attended college, but chose to train as a nurse so she could have a career and be independent. Selma and Ruth were finally able to escape Europe in 1941 and immigrated to Baltimore, where Hetty was living. My grandmother enlisted in the US Army. She was discharged with distinction as a lieutenant when the war ended and shortly after married my grandfather, Henry Kaufman, who was also a German Jewish refugee. They moved to Ashdown, Arkansas and had two daughters, my mother, Joanne, and my aunt, Laura. My, my paternal grandparents, Blima and Isaac Teichman, were born in Poland. My grandfather was a member of the Bund, a Jewish socialist political movement, and he left for Hungary in the 1920s to escape being targeted for his political activism. In 1926, he moved to Paris, where he rented a room with four friends. They had so little money that they purchased a single suit and they took turns wearing it on Shabbat. <laughs> My grandfather got work with a local merchant who sold shmatas, rags, and old clothes. His new partner happened to be my grandmother's brother, who, in 1932, encouraged her parents to send her to live with him in France. He thought the young man who worked with him would be a good match for her. My grandparents were married in late 1932. They settled in Trancy, a suburb of Paris near my grandmother's brother. They lived in a small two-room house across the street from the site that would later become the Trancy transit camp from which more than 64,000 Jews. Sorry. Uh, there's a page. Oh. We're deported. I don't know. Anyway, um, my grandparents remember anti-Semitism being present in France in the 1930s, especially on the far right. My uncles were called dirty Jew at school and were told, go back to your country. But for the most part, life continued as normal. My grandfather and great uncle founded the first synagogue in Trancy, first in someone's home, then in a small rented space. Jews in France were disturbed by what was happening in Germany, but never thought it would come to France. And yet, as Hitler and the Nazis grew in power, anti-Semitism in France got worse. People started blaming quote, the foreigner, which was code for the Jews, for economic problems. They were singled out as the reason for difficult times. When the war broke out in September 1939, my grandfather wanted to do his part, but he couldn't join the French army because he was not a citizen. Instead, he joined the French Foreign Legion, where many of his fellow soldiers were Jews and other refugees. After initial training, he was sent to North Africa, where he stayed for the duration of the war. My grandmother was left with the business and two young children, but she realized life had to go on. With the German occupation, food was very scarce. Many blamed the Jews for France's loss against Germany, and physical and verbal assaults against my uncles at school increased. By 1942, roundups of Jews grew more frequent. On July 15th, 
a local policeman and neighbor whose children played with hers, came to my grandmother and told her she needed to leave. He knew that the next day on July 16th, he would be taking part in the infamous Valdiv Roundup, in which more than 13,000 Jews were rounded up by French police, held under horrible conditions in an indoor bicycle stadium in Paris, and ultimately deported to Auschwitz after passing through the Trancy transit camp. Luckily, my grandmother already had a plan. A friend had told her that if she ever had to leave Trancy, she should go to a woman named Jeanne Coiffier in the village of Frete. Jeanne's husband was in a German POW camp and she would take them in. The day they left was one of the hottest of the year, but they put on sweaters for the train ride to hide their yellow stars. From the train station, they walked seven miles to Jeanne's farm and risking her own life and the lives of her daughters, she took them in. They lived in the dirt floor basement of Jean's small farmhouse, helping her in the fields whenever they could. Frete was a small village. Everyone knew they were Jews, but there was an unspoken promise of protection. There was one man in the town who supported the Vichy government. The mayor went to him and threatened his life if he betrayed my family. Incredibly, my grandmother and uncles made it to August 1944, the liberation of Paris, without any harm coming to them. My grandmother said the most beautiful sight she ever saw was an American tank rolling through the village because she knew they could return home. In Drancy, my grandparents were reunited. So many friends and neighbors never returned, including my grandfather's cousin and his three children, and the local rabbi's wife and seven children. It was a miracle that my grandparents' small family had survived, though the real miracle was Jean. My father, who was born a year after the war, an accident, remembers meeting her when, sorry, <laughs> remembers, <laughs> remembers meeting her when he was a child. He asked her why she helped his family, and her answer was simple. I figured it was the right thing to do. Such a simple sentiment, but so few people took that risk. My grandparents restarted their lives with nothing, but they were the lucky ones. My grandfather had seven brothers, but only one survived. He returned to Poland after the war to look for family and was hanged by Poles who thought he was coming back to reclaim his parents' little farm. Ultimately, no one on my grandfather's side survived he lost 87 relatives in the Holocaust. In 2015, Jean was posthumously named Righteous Among the Nations, an Israeli honor granted to non-Jews who took great risks to save Jews during the Holocaust. My family attended the ceremony at the Memorial de la Shoah in Paris. Almost 100 of Jean's relatives were in attendance as well. Many of them had no idea until that moment what she had done to save my family. And it was beautiful to see her reunite with my two uncles who hadn't seen each other in decades. Today I'm here due to no small part to strong women. My grandmother, Ellen, who left everything behind to start a new life in the United States. My grandmother, Blima, who kept her family safe. And Jean Coiffier, who, risks, who risked everything to rescue three strangers. Those amazing stories of my family's survival make me who I am today and have given me a sense of resilience and my faith. It's a privilege to continue to share their stories so that future generations can never forget and be upstanders. May their memories be for a blessing. I now light a candle in memory of my grandparents and one million of the six million Jews killed in the Holocaust. Thank you, Elvisa. 
how I hope you all are as moved as I am by these amazing stories. And it's so wonderful to see these strong young women here to sharing these stories, our future leaders. So thank you so much. Um, and now we welcome back Hazan Shrebker and the Congregation Share at This Choir to sing El Raleigh, El Mali Rachman. <laughs> Sorry. El malerachamim shochen b'amramim ametzel menuchani chona alekanfe.
El Male Rachamim, God full of mercy who dwells on high, grant fitting rest on the wings of the divine presence in the heights of the holy and the pure who shine like the radiance of heaven for the souls of the six million Jews, victims of the Shoah in Europe, who were murdered, slaughtered, burned, and exterminated for the sanctification of the name at the hands of the murderous German Nazis and their helpers from among the rest of the nations. Therefore, Master of Compassion, we ask that you shelter them in the shadow of your wings forever and bind their souls in the bonds of everlasting life. The Lord is their heritage. May the Garden of Eden be their resting place, and may they receive their reward at the end of days. Now let us say, Amen. I'm going to uh, invite, I know some of my rabbinic colleagues are here present. I'd like to invite you to come forward at this time. Uh, in just a moment, we'll be leading the community in the Mourner's Kaddish. And as you're coming forward, I'll just say a very quick word about the Kaddish. Uh, there's actually no reference to death whatsoever in the words of the Kaddish. In fact, it is focused on glorifying and praising God's name. And so as we recite the Kaddish to remember our loved ones and remember those lost in the Shoah. By praising God's name here, we accrue credit to their memory and to their souls in Olam Haba. And so we say, we invite Rabbi Stern, Rabbi Kasten. I thought I saw Rabbi Rada here as well, right? I invite you to come forward and join me as we lead our community in the Kaddish. Yit Gadal, Vit Kadash, Me Raba, Be Alma, Divra, Kirute, Yamlich Mahute, Be Chaye Hon, Yome Hon, of Chaye, the whole Beit Israel, Ba Agala, Vizman, Kariv, the Imru, Amen. Yehe Shme Raba, Mevorah, Leolam, Lome, Omaya, Yit Barach, the Ishtabach, Vit Paar, Vit Roman, Vit Nase. Vita dar vit ale vit alau, shme de kutsha brihu. Leela min po vir hata vishirata. Tush be hata venechamata. Da amiran be alma vi imru amen. Yehe shlama raba min shamaya. Vechaim alenu be al kol Yisrael vi imru amen. O se shalom vi murmav. We are Shalom. Alain Uel, Kol Yisrael, Kibiru. Amen. Please be seated for a few moments. Good evening. I'm Mark Zilberman, and I'm honored to serve as board chair for the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. On behalf of the board and staff of the museum, I want to thank everyone who participated in this deeply moving ceremony of remembrance. After two years of virtual commemorations, it's wonderful to be reminded how meaningful it is to gather together on this day. We are grateful to all of you here tonight for helping us remember the six million Jews murdered during the Holocaust and to honor our survivors. If you are looking for the true embodiment of the museum's mission to teach the history of the Holocaust and advance human rights to combat prejudice, hatred, and indifference, you need look no further than the group of people sitting in front of me. The Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum, as it stands today, would not exist without the passion, wisdom, and dedication of our survivors who came together to create a space to educate and to remember. To those here tonight, and for those no longer with us, thank you. Tonight you heard the stories of just a few survivors passed on by their grandchildren. 
There are so many more of these stories that need telling, of those who survived despite the Nazis' best efforts, and of those who did not get a chance to grow old or even get a chance to grow up. What we do tonight and what we do every day at the museum reaffirms our dedication to teaching this history and preserving these memories. Medor Lador from generation to generation. It feels like this commitment is more important than ever, even almost 80 years after the end of the Holocaust. Though the challenges we are facing today may seem insurmountable, we can all play a part in stemming the rising tide of anti-Semitism and narrowing the differences between us. We can speak up when we see something wrong, combat injustice and unfairness, and stand up for our friends and even for strangers. We can all be upstanders. I would like to close tonight as I began with gratitude. Thank you to Rabbi Sunshine and Congregation Sheriff Israel for being such gracious hosts. To Reve Campo, Lindsay Gerard, and Alyssa Teichman for sharing your grandmother, grandparents' legacies with us. To Azan Zrebker and the Congregation Sheriff Israel Choir. And to everyone who so generously supported this commemoration with thoughtful tributes and the program book. Thank you all for being with us tonight. I'd now like to light our last memorial candle for the evening in memory of one million of the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust. May their memories all be for a blessing. So much, Mark. It's such an honor to work with you. We close our commemoration tonight with Hatikva from Hazan Shrebkar and Congregation Sheriff is required. I hope, uh, please rise when we sing Hatikva. And I want to thank you all so much for being with us tonight. It was wonderful to be with you. It's very meaningful, and we appreciate your community. See you.